Welcome, Fernando. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for the invitation to, to talk about my last paper. As Jenny says, this paper was developed in, in Hasselhoff's lab in plant science department. As I say, I'm working now in the UNAM, in the National University of Mexico, in, in the groups of Sergio Sciences, uh, uh, trying to develop, uh, well, discover new natural products from uh, streptomyces uh, microorganisms. And now I am applying cell free to try to discover these new compounds. Okay. The title of the paper is Constructing Cell-Free Expression System for Low-Cost Access. But first, I'd like to give you an introduction why it's important to have low-cost access to these resources. Well, uh, we are at the beginning of the new bio biotechnological era. Along the history of the humanity, many new storms in the history has happened. The most important one, the most famous, is during the Industrial Revolution. But now we are in the overlapping uh, phase between electronics, informatics, and biology. Between this uh, intersection, we have now a field that we call synthetic biology or, and also genetic engineering. Uh, but what is synthetic biology? Basically, in, short, in a few words, synthetic biology is the overlapping between biology and engineering in order to develop a standardized tools to uh, research uh, and answer questions in a standardized way. So the synthetic biology fo follows this approach, the uh, design, building, test, and learn. And this is really important in the, that in synthetic biology, we want to have standardized tools because if we compare with what happens during the uh, industrial revolution, uh, uh, the, I don't the, think the industrial revolution in a factory device in many sections, and one department was taken take care of a specific part. And after they pulled together and ensemble to have steam machines and this kind of stuff. Thank you to this, we can be the innovators and the early adapters. For instance, modular cloning uh, or loop assembly is one of these techniques that we have here that has allowed us to go to uh, more complex techniques like CRISPR-Cas. So, but why is it expensive to work or trying to work in these fields in synthetic biology and engineering, in particular in low uh, and middle income countries like could be in Mexico, my home country? Well, this is because the regions and the equipment is expensive. If you can imagine, for instance, if I talk in what's happening in Mexico, uh, a region that costs here in the UK a hundred pounds, we can, uh, we have to buy it like four times, even seven times more expensive, so which is a huge disadvantage. And if we wanted to do synthetic biology, we have to think about enzymes and also synthetic DNA, because basically all synthetic biology is based on this. But also we have to develop skills as a difference between countries like UK. In Mexico, most of the, 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 the main force of research is made by the students, not by postdocs or or, or other researchers. So that means that we have to train people if we want to put these people inside in the research. And also we can have some problems with patents and license, but we can be solved with, with now with the open MTAs. But why is important synthetic biology? Well, synthetic biology has allowed us to produce the proteins. Proteins are the tools of the lives and they are important for many uh, proportions, for instance, biochemical reactions, we can use enzymes to produce sugars, amino acids, antibodies to detect pathogens, or proteins that can move, we can, that allow us to move some materials. And the proteins allow us to solve problems in the real world. So medicines, research, biofields. But how we can produce proteins? Well, as you know, the proteins are encoded in the genome. So basically uh, a gene encodes for a protein and the proteins can have their own activity or they can work together to have an active protein. And if we want to produce this protein for research or for any purpose, we have to produce maybe in a, in a, in, in a, a live system. The traditional uh, system is to have the protein, uh, take a strain that we want to select, codon optimize, put in a plasmid, choose a strong promoter or this promoter that is better for us, transform and test, design and build. And sometimes it takes time and money to do it. So there is an alternative that can allow us to do this prototyping really fast and in a cheap way, which is cell-free. 
Self-free basically is a, a transcription, a translation system, which has these components that are the extracellular, uh, the cellular extracts, where it contains the polymerases, ribosomes, uh, a mixture of nucleotides, energy, amino acids, and DNA template with the gene of interest. The one of the main parts or why it's expensive if we consider that cell-free is because they use this energy source, particularly PET and creatine phosphate are one of the most expensive, which is a problem. But talking about cell-free, we have different variants of cell-free. Even when you do or when you do restriction analysis, that is considered cell-free because you have a, a enzyme that allows to put DNA or something, and this is a cell-free assay. We have also the pure version, which in which you purify all the components that are necessary for the for the transcription and the translation machinery to produce the proteins. If we compare how is the 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 what is the, are the difference between in vivo and in cell free system? Basically, in, in vivo system can allow us to have a, a useful or active protein after one or uh, two weeks. Because as I say, we have to transform, grow the cells, lyse the cells and produce the components. But in cell-free, we can like split into parts. So in the first, in the square that are in your right, you can see that we grow the cells and we disrupt the cells and we store the extracts, which is really important because now we can keep for even for years in a freezer and after use when we need it. And after you, we just as energy mixture, with the DNA, and we can produce proteins in one, two days. The cell-free system is really important because it allows to use, to produce, to your manufacturing molecules, like modified proteins for therapeutics, nowadays for portable diagnostics devices, and the discovery of metabolic pathways and engineering, which is something that I am currently now in Mexico. And, in, and this kind of stuff. So for instance, I'm going to tell an example that maybe you have read this paper, but for the, the year from the 2016, so six years ago, they, these authors partly developed a, a device that they call low cost diagnostic device. With that, this time was really good because they allow us to have a sensor to detect based on two holes, uh, the, by, by the Zika virus. But if we go deeper for the paper, it was really low cost because they use pure express system, which each, each reaction, reaction only costs, well, not only, costs 26 pounds, which is really expensive. But this is really good because for diagnostics, because after this, uh, two years after they published a similar uh, uh, paper, but now for the detection of norovirus. Other groups like uh, in Switzerland, Barbora, try to produce in a low cost the, the, this pure system. So they basically, they pull in one pot all the plasmid that produce this protein necessary for the transcription and translation, purify them and, and allow to produce one single reaction for only almost $1 per reaction, which is okay. Also uh, working with Anibal and also Jenny, Jim, we developed this uh, self-free RNA sensing system for low cost, maybe you already know it. So basically, uh, Aníbal say, okay, we can we use instead of pure instead of use pure, can we use cell extracts to characterize these ribosome switches? So he do some controls. He managed to see that was possible, and also using a cheap energy source, which is maltodextrin. After he do some characterization. He's, uh, he compared the, the same uh, ribose switch that Pardi used in the Zika uh, paper. He uh, tests them with now with a new system and we managed to do it. But after he go further, he uh, uh, say, okay, build a plasmid is also always difficult and it's expensive because you have to spend time. But what's happening if we wanted to use linear DNA instead? So he developed uh, this uh, CRISPR engineering strain to remove all the nucleases that, uh, that uh, break the, the, the DNA. And testing a sensor for uh, the potato vi virus, he managed to do it. Well, now with this uh, background, uh, I think 
I thought that I could go further and reduce even more the costs. So basically the paper is divided in three sections. So a section for low like cost low drying system, the ultra low cost cell free. And we discover also that lactose is as can work like an additive. So you are going to understand a bit better in a moment. So here I show you two systems how to dry stock in the lab. So in the right, you have the expensive one. So just to tell you how each cost, it costs the 2,000, you know, 25,000 pounds, which is a lot. If we compare with a 100 pounds device, that is basically a desiccator that everybody or most of the labs has with some silica bits to drag it. So I decided to see if this can be comparable to the results or the achievement if we dry or sell extracts. Well, here I show you how they look. So uh, the, with the high loss leophilization, we have like uh, sugar uh, cubes. In contrast, the low cost drying, you can see that it's just like something that is in the bottom of the tube. So at the first day, the high cost uh, the, uh, approach in that is in yellow. So using PEF as energy source, because all we also want to compare if we can use maltodextrin instead of PEP because PEP is expensive. Uh, we see that after one day, uh, uh, was okay. The, the, the efficiency was almost like in, we can reach in the fresh samples. After two weeks, it decreased. And it, the same happens with the low cost drying system. In PEF, and in maltodextrin, but something uh, curious happened that in maltodextrin keeps basically the same after two weeks. Maybe because maltodextrin is a, also a sugar, it's a polymer that is, is helping. But at this point, we didn't test yet any sugar as a, a cryoprotectant. So we decided to test the sugars because uh, it's well known that the sugars can act like a, a leoprotectant. And the sugars are one of the cheapest way to keep uh, trying these systems. So I tried trellos that has been documented, sucrose, maltose, lactose, and raffinose. Uh, here, the, the points that I want to mark is that depends of the concentration is how is the efficiency, because we can claim that trellos is the best, but if it's really high concentration, I didn't show you here, the, uh, the, they stop to work in the, the cell-free uh, uh, reactions. But something that was really nice happening during this, uh, during, during the development of this project, maybe you cannot see, but in the letter I, uh, I uh, in the lactose maltodextrin, in the uh, green bars, in when I add the I have to have control, so I add also the lactose, and I see like increment almost two times, which was something surprising because in other in the other sugars and also in the PEP system, I didn't see this uh, increasing in the protein production, which was really good because maybe we can use it as as uh, as added additive. So I decided to put all these fresh samples now in in the same context, and I see that the fresh samples. In PEV, if I don't add lactose using maltodextrin, is basically the half of the yield, which is not really good because yes, we are we are using a cheap energy source, but the yields are the half of PEV. But if we add lactose, we achieve almost the same, the well basically the same, like if we use PEP. And obviously, PEV with with uh, lactose is like the best, but it, it, I think that it's okay. Uh, so after do this uh, uh, system or this study systematically, we discovered that we can use trialos or sucrose as cryo pro, cryo, cryo preservants. And we can I just see. Interrupt for half a minute. Does anyone have a blue and silver bicycle which is locked? You've sourced it. Sorry. Thanks very much. <laughs> Yeah, we discovered that uh, sucrose can be one be the best because works in both systems in PEP and in maltodextrin. But sucrose is also good to use because it's the cheapest uh, 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 sugar. So 
depends of the the system that we are using we explain in the in the paper which is the best option for you because maybe in your lab you don't have uh, sucrose but you have trellos so you you can see which concentration is better or works better for you so after have this system so just take this observation of the lactose in your mind because we are going to go back but after we saw this that we can use a low cost approach to to dry cell free reaction we decide to distribute so basically using a food vacuum sealer some argon we uh, pack the 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 these strips with the cell free already dry and we put in this nice bag with a key key code that has all the instructions and we distribute so basically the the users that receive this parcel just just have to open as 20 microliters of water to reconstitute the dry DNA because the subs already has a dry, dry DNA put in the cell-free mixture that is also dry and wait a half an hour to produce a protein. Obviously, it depends on the proteins is the is the how long it take. So we distribute this to Chile, obviously Mexico, and we keep the, a copy in the UK. So after a deal with the customs, with the, <laughs> the arrival of not even one of the packs was was open in Mexico. So I was really scared because maybe it was not working, but it works. So we see that we can produce in the in the yellow bars we have the high cost and the purple bars in below we have the low cost. So basically we could share and we have basically the same. By naked I you cannot distinguish which is what. Maybe in some case I don't know. So from this, I decide to keep in my in my drawer the, the, the samples. And after two months, uh, challenge the system. What's happened? They are still having some, uh, uh, we can still have in, uh, active uh, extracts. Well, after four months, what's, what's happened that obviously, the, um, as I expected, the high cost lyophilization system has the better yields, but the low cost drying is really well. So he, they really uh, do really well. So I think that if we compare the initial cost, how uh, how you want to spend for a for a dryer, a, a, a professional dryer versus the this equipment, but it's worth to use. Okay, now another part of the paper is that this observation that we made. So the lactose is enhanced the production of the protein in the cell free reaction based on maltodextrin. And you and we say, okay, it's also can also happen if we use linear DNA. So instead of use GMS or another protein to or cheat sequence to protect the linear DNA, we decide to put just long flanks. So 100 flanks in each linear DNA and like to, to, to protect our DNA and challenge the system using lactose and another sugar that in this case was trellos. With PEP in the in the graph on your left, you can see that the plasmid is always the best. When we add lactose, yes, yeah, we've seen some increment in C and D, but in maltodextrina where we saw the effect, is better, the, uh, the achievement is better than if we use the, just the plasmid. So just take in mind that we are not using plasmid plus uh, lactose because plasmid plus lactose is bigger. So it's just a plasmid and we are challenged between linear DNA plus lactose. And we reach this 30 uh, micromolar of superfall GFP. So going to reading in literature, we discover, well, well no, yes, uh, that the this company in the state, the, the Mighty Extil, they produce cell extracts and the core of the extracts are made on maltodextrin. So I say, okay, if it's working with maltodextrin, can be also work. So when I add the lactose, I see that I have better yields using the system. But when I add also to the system of Mighty Extil the lactose, they reach basically the same level that I did. So basically the company, can use lactose now to improve their own <laughs> stuff. Uh, but this is really nice to have a uh, proteins that, that we can see by naked eyes that are fluorescent because they're funny and are cool. But what if we want to produce real molecular regions uh, for, the, for the real life? 
after the pandemic, you know that the lamp is becoming uh, really famous. So everybody wanted to do lamp. For the people that doesn't know what is lamp, lamp is a loop mediated isothermal amplification, which works basically with six primers. They do these uh, like barbells uh, shapes or dumbbells belt, and we can detect a positive or a negative result. So I say, okay, if my system works with the TC event promoter, so I can buy whatever plasmid in, in or order in that gene. So why, that is what I did. So I ordered this plasmid that encode these BSTAs, that is the isothermal uh, polymerase. I put in the system and I could express, as you can see, the protein. With using lactose, is you see a, a, a bigger band that without lactose. And after I reformulate uh, with the, because it is good when the patents are open. So for instance, NIV, they have opened all the protocols to perform their own regions. So I, I, I see, I prepare my own buffers and I can test the homemade version versus the lamp assays. As you can see, basically it's the same. Like, uh, and after I decide to test also in samples that were dried using our local system. And after two weeks, we couldn't, we could uh, produce a, a active uh, lamp, an active lamp assay. And the good thing is that it's eight times less expensive than if you go with the commercial one. And I think that I'm sure that we can reduce the cost even more. And also I want to say, okay, other regions that I say at, at the beginning of the talk was that the enzymes are also expensive and sometimes are, uh, it takes time to produce them. Basically because for instance, Nicola doesn't want to have something that could take on DNA. <laughs> so I find the sequence of BSA1 because BSA1 is patent, I think. <laughs> I ordered the G block and I decided to at the in these huge flanks, the T7, the T7 promoter, the ribosome inside, and the terminator. But as you can see, the companies only only allow me to synthesize 200 base pairs, and also it's expensive. So I say to okay, I can have some adapters, primers, and some comp core primers, which only change the sequence. I did a, a PCR using the four plasmids, the four sorry, the four uh, uh, oligos. And I had this band, that's so why I purify it with a, a with any kit. And after I test with a, in the second uh, uh, line is with which without buffer and without glycerol. Yes, in, in the third is with glycerol. And the first is the commercial one. As you can see, well, is working has activity. Unfortunately, we couldn't reproduce this uh, drying in a drying system. Maybe it's because it's linear DNA, but not plasmid. Well, at least it's one step. And after we decide to check if we can remove or which are the really which of the components are really necessary in the mixture in the buffer that we use, because basically it has all of these ATPs, folinic acid, putrazine, spermidine, tRNAs, COA that are expensive. So based on which were the most expensive is how I construct this table. So in the first uh, row, you, I, I have the full reaction with all the components that are here. And I remove in the second line, I remove the acetyl coenzyme A in the third line, the tRNAs and in this consecutive way. So as there are, no, there are some that are not really essential. So for instance, I can't use a, without tRNAs and acid consume in my uh, reaction and the performance the, the performance is gonna be the same basically. And there are, I call no essentials. Uh, and I, I, there are another that are beneficial like espermidine or some nucleotides. But that is why something that was really surprising for me because when I remove all of them, basically without removing the ATP, I still having the production or at 40% if I compare with it 100%, which is really good because removing basically all the stuff and, and have 
protein production was something that was really good and interesting, but was not happening in maltodextrin, which was so, was something curious. But at this point, we could develop an ultra low cost system because removing this is really really basically the half of the price, and this can be use, useful at least for teaching because you can see in your left right side, we have without any NITPs and the full reaction, and for a classroom, I think that it's okay. Okay, we decide to say, okay, what is happening? Uh, 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 in both cases, in, in this table, I show you when I ask lactose with and without lactose, because as I explained before, it's an additive. And yes, you can see that with maltodextrin is always a power. <laughs> um, here in the left side, you can see the ultra low cost system. The, 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 the yield basically are the half, well, 40% of, of the total. Uh, in blue is nothing, no ATPs, no lactose is less. So the, from this blue line to the purple line, just the lactose gives us this jump to have a ultra low cost system. Uh, we perform some mass spec because to see what's happening. So in the, here I show you based on PET, without lactose and with lactose, what is happening? So there is, uh, as you can see, there is a, a, a synthesis of nucleotides, which is really good and something that we didn't expect that we still have in the extracts this activity. And also there is a consumption of pyruvate when they have lactose. So something in the metabolisms, but I cannot say from the bacteria because it's no more bacteria probably the cell-free reaction is happening. You, do you remember that I told you that in maltodextrin doesn't happen the production or it's not sustainable, the, pro, the proteins? It's not sustainable, but the synthesis of nucleotides is happening. So something in, in the metabolism is happening because I, I assume that because PEV in the in Krebs cycles is closer than in maltodextrin, maltodextrin pathway basically is the same like the, path, the, like the pathway that I use PEV, but far away. So something is happening. So as you can see, the, there is a active a synthesis of nucleotides, monophosphate nucleotides also, they are moving and also there is a consumption of pyruvate, so there is moving. So here I show you the control. The control is basically the extracts without uh, anything more, with no uh, PEV or maltodextrin, just the extracts. So they don't have any, any activity. But how much cost to perform a cell-free reaction with our improved method? Well, we can go, uh, we can uh, even optimize the prices. If we, for instance, if we decide to use PEV for Sigma, each reaction can cost almost uh, 0.06 reaction, uh, pounds per reaction. But if we go for a, a cheaper suppliers that maybe nobody knows, they have the same activity and the, the prices are can be reduced. For instance, one gram of, of, of PEV, if we buy in Sigma costs uh, 285 uh, pounds by, by per gram, but it's only 12 pounds if we buy by the supplier. In maltodextrin, the, the reaction is, a, is basically more or, less, more or less in the same ratio. But if you can see in the, the pie charts, the gray part is the nucleotide mix that we remove in ultra in our ultra low cost system that is in the panel number T. So removing all of this, the, the main cost is now PEP, is not the nucleotide mixture. And here based on here is based on sigma, but if we change to sigma to alpha SR, just one reaction cost. 0 0.02 uh, pounds, which is really nothing. <laughs> and basically, the, as I say, the cell extract now is the main, the main uh, uh, is the most expensive now. The PEV is not. And if we compare, for instance, with my TXTL, we have reduced using ultra low cost system 200 times. If we compare with pure system, pure, you remember that it's really, really expensive. It's 600 times, 800 times. So the numbers are really crazy. 
And what the perspective is to adopt the cell free state technology to research and teaching labs, produce molecular reagents for diagnostic teaching. All the protocols are more explained and are already linked to protocols IO, so everybody can use. And this is something that is can be used in the is is making me happy because we can in the low and middle income countries we can do science the science that actually are doing in the spacecraft. So now they are using cell free to produce their own proteins that they are going to use in the space. So which is really good. And the last thing that I did when I was in, during my time in Cambridge was to develop more educational resources. So I have some chromoprotein using the ultra low cost system, some uh, uh, dual reporters that basically has a, a Laxet and GFP. So we, you can put the, the UV lamp, see the GFP and have the, the substrate to produce this reaction, this colorful thing and also produce uh, some nice compounds. And the take home message is basically this. <laughs> we have produced active compounds without adding nucleotides, which is really good. We drop the cost. We discover that uh, the lactose increase the production of proteins in a maltodextrin system. And the silicon bits can be used as an alternative for the, to preserve cell-free reactions and just i want to thank you to all the consortium that i belong to uh, is the local bio diagnostics uh, consortium which was hit by jim ayoka jim Haslop, paul freeman stephen hushim uh, jen malloy and all my lab members in Haslop's labs that they always look me weird because was the guy that doesn't work with plants in plant science <laughs> and all the funding thank you Everybody. So um, time for any questions or questions. Questions. So I think for people in the room, just pop your hand up and also people on the on the Zoom, just feel free to put your virtual hand up and we'll call on you because I think it'd be good to actually state the question. Um, we haven't tried the uh, sound in here yet, so we may have to relay it. We'll see. It may come out of your laptop. This work. Um, so I think we'll we'll hand one question to people in the room to start off with, and then we'll move to the Zoom channel. Um, so anyone in the room got a question or comment for Fernando on the paper? Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we see the purification of protein from cell-free extract. If you could just repeat the question for the Zoom. So the question is. How is the strategy to produce proteins using cell free versus the commercial? Yeah, the, the purification yeah. Well, the purification is basically the same. So, for instance, if I use, if I want to purify a protein producing cell free, I can use nickel columns that are like a spin columns if it's a, a, a small amount, or I can use agarose bits to use. So, basically, you have the protein. So, it is when you purify, basically, you just uh, have uh, you you jump some steps because if you produce in a at a lower way you have to disrupt the cells but you already have disrupt the cells so you have to go the process. That's easier. I wonder if, if the shield is much stronger. Well, is it all, all, always depends of the of the protein. For instance, this was using superfall GFP, but in terms we can achieve until three milligrams per mL of protein of GFP, but obviously depends uh, because uh, in theory, we you don't we use cell free, we can manage to produce proteins that are not, that, that, can, that can go to inclusion body, but it's also it also could happen depending on the nature of the protein. Okay, so then, uh, just a bit further on to this question. In your final slides, where you compared the cost per reaction for um, your in house proteins versus the commercial products. Um, did you compare the differences between the cheap two pence in house and then the six pence commercial regions I use? Well, uh, here they asked me if I compare the yields between the commercial uh, products versus the my homemade products. Yes. And the, the, the numbers are made on just how cost to produce the protein. But 
if we remember, there is one slide where I compare with maltodextrin. And I will show you what is the last slide. Here, here I'm comparing the yields. If you see the yields uh, that is in the, with number, with letter E, my yield still, if is uh, basically are the same, the commercial, that mine. If I add lactose, I have better results. And I also can improve the commercial using lactose. Okay. So this is per reaction, right? Yes, this is per reaction. So this is the concentration per reaction, but obviously you have to take in mind, change the volume because the volume is 12 microliters. <laughs> it looks like this is a lot, but yes, yeah. it's just the concentration in 12 microliters. <laughs> So Akash has a, has a question. I think Akash, you can unmute. I don't know. Yeah, sure. It's good to see you again, Fernando. Uh, yes, Akash, I cannot uh, help, uh, hear you. Uh, is that better? Can you hear me now? No, I cannot hear. Um, is your mic, is your um, computer muted? My computer no. is not muted, but Akash computer. I am I'm don't think I'm muted, oh, so. Because, um, Akash, uh, we're just going to, could you mute your microphone? I will mute. Is that better? So now you can hear me, but I can't hear Fernando. Wait, Fernando, if you talk, can I hear you? Wait. So I, ca I can't. Uh, you, if you just ask the question, then Fernando can unmute and answer you. We basically have a one-way system on, on sound coming out at this end. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, Basically, I, I liked the fact that you could just uh, systematically remove all the things to reduce the costs. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I know Annabelle was doing some, was Annabelle doing some stuff with uh, doing some CRISPR uh, eye stuff to kind of remove the nucleases. Could you do stuff along the line of upregulating just the base number of nucleotides that you're going to have inside these uh, systems as well? I don't know how you do it. But get, getting to a point where you could upregulate all of the basic stuff that you need, so you only have to do a cell free mix, and then have a your know, ultra cost low cost system having a similar level of performance without adding all the additives that you normally add. Does that kind of make sense in terms of? Do you think it'd be feasibly possible to kind of CRISPR the strains that you use that you get the same amount of performance without the need of uh, additive, like without the need to add the energy mixes of the additives that you need. Hi, Akash. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for uh, the for the question. And yes, I think that is possible because if you're uh, as you uh, well point, uh, Anibal, what I what he did was to engineering this strain, and they produce the extracts for these strains and they have no nucleases that attack the linear DNA. And it's possible because actually there's, if you wanted to produce more complex proteins, for instance, some that has a disulfur bonds, you need to use chaperones. So nowadays the, the, in the cell free, you have to produce, your, you have to add in your cell free some chaperones, but there are now new alternatives that say, okay, maybe I can, uh, transform my plasmid in the E. coli strain, produce the growth the cells and disrupt. And I assume, or we assume that these chaperones, these proteins are inside, that they improve the, the cell-free reaction. So yes, it depends. Uh, and, it, and this can be also useful for work in, in eukaryotic cells. Uh, yeah, it, it, it would be really, Cool if we can engineer more, more strains. Actually, there is another really cool strain from the ST group, I think, that they have the autolysis strain. So the engineering the strain, they put a plasmid and the list and the strain is autolysis. So you don't need to use even a sonicator or something and you have your own strain. So it depends which is the chassis that you choose. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I suppose it is a balance of working out how much you can do to E. coli before you're like, okay, let's do pick here cell free or let's do service size cell free or mammalian cell free. So, cause I've now moved to a lab where, so I'm technically a postdoc, but I haven't submitted yet, Fernando. So I'm, a, I'm in a weird position, um, but I'm, I'm working in a lab where they do a lot of pick here cell free and they do a lot of, um, well, trying to do a lot of like show cell free as well. Uh, and it seems so painful. I'm not doing it, thanks. 
I'm very happy I'm not doing it, but uh, yeah, it seems so painful. So it'd be really, really curious to see if you could get E. coli to the level where you don't need to use the more complex cell free methods. Yeah, that was it. I don't have any more questions. Just yeah, I'll I'll be up in Cambridge soon, so I'll see you then. Yes, Rafik, please. No. Uh, <laughs> I was just responding to what Akash was saying. There, there are some papers where, where they've overexpressed nucleotide kinase enzymes and then prepared um, cell free extract from that. And they weren't using it for the, the NTP synthesis, they were using it for the NTP so they could use it for PCR. But the enzymes are the same ones that do the, the NTP regeneration and the DNTP regeneration. So you could, you could overexpress the enzymes and, and prepare the, the cell free extract from that. Yes, yeah, it's something that the, actually there is this paper from ah, which is the group where you are Jenny, <laughs> that they basically they produce the fusion protein, the polymerase, just breaking the cells and put the direct extracts. So I think that the imagination is like the limit how you can use. The advantage of cell free as I see is the prototyping is faster. You can keep in your fridge to perform only once the extracts and after you you are concerned more about to produce the plasma. Yes. I have a question. Um, so what, um, would you recommend that people kind of, so what, what strain would you recommend using for the, um, the production of the restriction enzymes? Because were you using uh, Annabelle's engineered strain with the nucleases edited out for your production? Yeah, because we we tried to do them in in a different strain before, and I mean, because it's not so much that the enzyme isn't produced, but you just get carryover with the X nucleases unless you do like proper purification, which means that you can digest stuff, but as soon as you digest the plasma, it starts getting eaten, <laughs> so you end up with a smear, whatever you do. So I I just wondered, kind of, would you say that would be your default strain now, or since writing the paper, have there been other strains that have come out? that are kind of multi-purpose E. coli strains of making cell extract that you would recommend? Well, for the cell extracts, I really recommend the, I think the, the better so far is the BL21 uh, D start from uh, in vitro gen. And it's really nice because for instance, now in Mexico, we are doing, do, using cell free to, to genes that has really high content of GCs because it's from streptomyces is one of the characteristics of the streptomyces and they have tested in other strain like rosetta and they don't work it now in in vivo or in cell free extracts they are working really good because they have some mutations that stabilize the messenger the rna the mrna and they produce the protein and but this is in cell free but in in vivo approach to use a uh, equal strain to produce this kind of nucleases there is one strain that is because, for instance, they, when I was reading the how produce BSA one, apparently they produce in Bacillus, but there is one strain that is, they, this is special. I don't remember the name, but they have some mutations that I allows to produce this kind of a uh, restriction enzymes. So to in vivo, yes, you have to put a, speci a specific strain. But for cell free, is working really nice, and depends uh, as I as as you say. The, the goal of your research. Because for instance, for antibodies, I think that Michael Lewitt is using the origami too. So because they can produce this, this sulfur bonds. So this depends which. And we have a question from the chat, which is, um, Stefan is wondering if you're already working on scaling up reaction volumes. Um, and a second question, which I think will be quicker to answer is, what dye were you using for the colorimetric lamp assay? 
Well, first, the scale of the reaction, yes. But actually, I, uh, this is something that I, I, I did. Uh, I make a mistake when I was working in cell free that I wanted to put instead of, for instance, prepare 12 reactions, just prepare once in a, in a huge tube of an ependor. But apparently, and according to literature, depends the size of the of, of the base. So because they need to have a, a concentration of oxygen to to produce the, the proteins. And, uh, and there is a couple of papers that they describe how, uh, how the cell free reaction is affected by the size. Indeed, there is a company in the USA that they have done some work related to this question that basically they have some, imagine these cassettes that you use for dialysis, they put the cell free reaction in this, uh, a kind of type of these cassettes and you can put like five mils of cell free and do it in a way. And the advantage of these cassettes is they have the proper uh, interchange of gases, which is happening. So if I wanted to, uh, scale up, I need to consider this. And so far, I we have kept in this small volume for this, uh, for this. Because which was another question? Uh, which dye for the colorimetric lamp? Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Which was it? I think it's phenol, <laughs> if it's any, it's phenol red. Yeah, it's not, it's, we, we is red, red, uh, chrom, chromophen, chromosome. It's one of the reds <laughs> because remember that the the lamp say is based on H, on pH, so basically it is the red chrome or something, uh, and I prepare according with the recipe that uh, and the patent that is published by NIV. So I didn't use their own stock. So I prepare all the things that you see here in the home colorimetric assay was performed by me. So. And it's because the, the recipes are open. But yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a color that changes according with the change of pH. Because remember, when the, the lamp start happening, there is a change in pH. And, and taking this advantage is why we use this colorimetric stop to change the pH. Are there any questions from the chat? Um, so in the interest of finishing on time, I think we will leave it there, but thank you very much, very much everybody for joining us. Um, we can also say a quick, uh, we can actually turn this around and you can see the room. You want to wave to the guys on the chat? <laughs> um, yeah, thank, thank you, you everybody. And thank you so much to Fernando for his presentation. We'll do a final round of applause for Fernando. Very much. Um, so we're going to head off and get some lunch with Fernando now. But um, thanks for spending the time with us. If you've got any uh, questions, so um, we have recorded this. I'll maybe do some slight edits <laughs> to get rid of the technical challenges. Um, and you said you're happy for us to post on yeah, YouTube. Sure. Great. Um, are you happy for people to email you if they have further questions? All right, great. So I think your email address is readily accessible online and of course the paper yeah, is also readily accessible right my name yeah and exactly you'll, you'll, you'll find him so yeah um so feel free to get in touch with any further questions that come to you um we haven't got a paper announced for next month's reimagining biomanufacturing journal club just yet but if you have any ideas then feel free to send them straight to me which is jcm80 at cam.ac.uk um and otherwise we'll be advertising that in the coming couple of weeks and yeah wonderful see you all soon bye, bye.